Yes. Good morning again. So we'll continue with uh, where we left off uh, on Tuesday, that is. Uh, the program roughly for today is I'll finish up with the flow loss. We, so we on Tuesday, we ended with uh, diffusion creep. We'll briefly look at dislocation creep. And then I'll have to put up a deformation mechanism map. And I'll explain very briefly what's in that deformation mechanism map. Then we'll look at um, briefly the effect of melt on rheology. And then we'll move on to the transient part. So we talked about basically steady state deformation and the background to that. The background will all be useful when I talk about transient creep, that is seismic properties, and then extending into longer term deformation. So all the background that we know, everything that we know about um, defects, grain boundaries, all that applies to transient creep as well. But the models are light, slightly different. So I'll try to explain a little bit of that. And then briefly some applications of the uh, experiments that we've been doing. So we'll see how far we get. I don't think I'll get to water in olivine. So if there is great interest, I'm happy to discuss that briefly next week if you guys aren't tired of me talking all the time. So um, there is that option. But it, I didn't want to cram too much into, these, into this lecture. So continuing from where we left off, so we have a differential stress, concentration gradients. We have diffusion. We derived um, a constitutive equation, at least we experimentalists call it that way, whether it's fluid dynamically a proper constitutive equation. We had some discussions. But um, basically, the important parameters are that you know the strain rate here depends on stress, and it depends on grain size and temperature and pressure um, via this um, enthalpy, tr enthalpy term. And just for reference again, so here in this you know fully um, derived equation, we have a constant which is different than this constant. And then in here, that's the diffusion part. That also has a diffusivity, so a constant in it. And then there's another constant. So all these constants effectively are wrapped into one. And the data that you get, and um, so I, should, I showed some of the data here. So this is an example of deformation experiments um, that I did some time ago as a function of temperature. So the colors here correspond to temperature 1150 to 1350 degrees C. So one of the things that's critical, of course, is getting a good constraint on the activation energy. And therefore, there is interest in doing these deformation experiments over a broad temperature range. Of course, you run into experimental um, issues here. So at 1150, you can see that the strain rates are very low. So to get deformation in here, you're going to have to sit around for quite a while uh, and waiting you know, for this data point to acquire, for this data point to accumulate, basically. It's an overnight, just one step at a constant strain rate. So there is limits um, as to how long you want to sit around as a student postdoc or otherwise researcher and get a data point here. And then on the upper end, of course, you have also technical limitations. So unfortunately, what that means that we have to extrapolate considerably in strain rate. Right? We can't do, for obvious reasons, strain rates as we have in the Earth of the order of 10 to the minus 12, 13, 14 or so. Right? That's one of the biggest extrapolations that we have to make of these flow laws um, in time. You know, there's really nothing we can do about that. And that's where the importance of having some idea what's behind these equations, you know, so some physical mechanism behind it so that we can or we think we can make the extrapolation because we have a physical model of what's actually going on. And therefore, we're willing to extrapolate what we measure in the lab. Um, and the other big um, extrapolation that we're making is in grain size. So um, this grain size here, most of these grain sizes are uh, less than 10 micron. In the Earth, we have grain sizes. We think we have grain sizes based on, for example, xenoliths and ophiolites and, and the like. So natural observations, we have grain sizes in the millimeter to centimeter range. But you can see here, right? so the color coding again is temperature. You can see that you know, a whole bunch of temperatures here overlap when clearly right, they should be separated. And of course, the reason is that we have grain size variations in here as well. These samples didn't all have the same grain size. So even though they were done at a different temperature, they overlap because we have a very strong, as it turns out, I'll show that next. If you fit the data, you have a cubic grain size dependence. right? So that's a very strong grain size dependence. Uh, and that explains the overlap here in temperature. So if we normalize this to the same grain size, they all would be nicely separated and just color-coded by temperature. 
So an indication, so these are the fit parameters. You can see what's plotted here is log stress versus log strain. Um, that's the stress, so basically the stress sensitivity here. And you can see that, right, this is where the empirical part comes in because the theory predicts that the um, strain rate is linearly dependent on stress. But if you fit all of this data, then, uh, sorry, then it uh, turns out that, you know, the, the stress dependence is a little bit nonlinear. And that's just what you find in these experiments. But you can see that all the data, I couldn't, so if I try to force a linear grain size dependence, right, that line here, that thin blue line, would just be at an angle to that data. Right? I can't fit that data with that exact linear grain size dependence. Here's the, uh, uh, sorry, st linear stress dependence. Here's the grain size dependence. And you can see the data is a bit more scattered um, without going into too many details. Essentially, I have to calculate, I can measure the grain size um, before and after the experiment, but during the experiment, I have to calculate the grain size, right? Because again, at those low strain rates, I'm sitting long enough at a temperature that I actually have grain growth. So I have to take that into account. And that, you know, is obviously a source of error in here so that I get more scatter in this uh, data. And then the activation energy that I mentioned, that actually looks pretty nice. So there's no reason to, to think that the activation energy changes over this you know, uh, 1150 to 1350 degree temperature range. And that's actually fairly wide temperature range for what is typically done experimentally here in this area. The activation energy should exactly coincide with um, the deactivation energy for, as we said, grain boundary diffusion, right? So diffusion, so what's rate controlling in these experiments is the slowest diffusing species along its fastest path. And we said that the slowest diffusing species here, you can see that silicon, that's for interior diffusion here, silicon, uh, oxygen, magnesium, silicon, magnesium, oxygen. Um, so silicon is the slowest. So th this is log diffusivity here versus temperature, inverse temperature. And yeah, silicon, you know, diffuses by, at a given temperatures, temperature, you know, much slower than any of the other constituents of olivine. <laughs> So that's the slowest diffusing species along its fastest path, as we said, are the grain boundaries. And um, if we look at then the diffusion here and compare, so diffusion, if you measure diffusivities, you'll get an activation energy from this plot of inverse temperature. So in our fit then this, because the temperature dependence is that of diffusion, we should have an activation energy that corresponds to the silicon activation energy for the grain boundary diffusion. But often you'll find that that's not exactly the case, right? That this, uh, and you know, the, the experimental, um, experimentally measured activation energies for diffusion have their own errors, of course, but typically they don't coincide along with a stress exponent that's not exactly linear, suggesting that it's a little bit more complicated. We don't just have diffusion along grain boundary, grain boundaries quite possibly there's something else going on. And yeah, this is where the, the uh, flow law is empirical. But the next part, the something else that's going on, it's, it turns out there's even theoretically a little bit more to it. So pure diffusion creep, the way we derived that, we have compression on one side, sorry, sorry the larger errors here, compression on one side, um, basically a smaller stress, so you have a differential stress between these two. And if you do that long enough, we said we have diffusion along grain boundaries or through the interior. When we impose that stress, we get a macroscopic change, right? We shorten or we change the shape by our deformation of the whole aggregate. And the way this is drawn here, along with the shape change, each individual grain should change its shape exactly proportional to what the aggregate as a whole is doing. Right? That's how we derived it. Um, from each grain phase, we have diffusion and so forth. So for an elongation overall, we should also, <coughs> of the whole aggregate, we should get an elongation of each individual grain. What's observed, so if you look at this um, image here, that's a, a scanning electron microscope image. What you can see here probably with the range of grain scales is orientation contrast. So you see these are all grains with exactly the same composition. That's all olivine. They just have different orientations and therefore a different backscatter coefficient. So you can see that this aggregate after deformation 
you know, considerable strain in here, it doesn't look like this, right? The grains actually, actually continue to look equiaxed. They look about the same as before deformation. Are those, are those individual yeah, these are so everything that has the same grayscale as an individual crystal. So if, you, so if, you, so if each crystal, uh, uh, sorry, so if, um, it's so on. If, if you know, olivine has some sort of like an elastic elastic tensor, so if elastic constants are different in different directions, is that what what drives? Is that one reason why you would have grains in different orientations that deform in different amounts? No, they're, they're different orientations. So no, in different orienta they're different orientations, and so if you have some grains that are relaxed and some that are, there are some that are that are. So, I mean, looking at so, basically in the experiment, what we do, we start out with a random orientation of all the, the grains. So these grains, you know, at the start of the experiment are randomly oriented, and then we impose a macroscopic strain. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, how that strain, that's one of the questions, actually. And, and people have just started, Brian Evans and one of his students, um, they just started looking at this issue. What happens uh, during when you impose a macroscopic deformation on a grain scale? That's actually very complicated. Okay. So yes, the, the olivine internally is um, anisotropic, as I discussed earlier. And therefore, you'd expect that there is a relationship between orientation and the externally applied stress. Mm -hmm. But it, the problem is actually bigger. I'll show that okay. at the very end. Because every grain has neighbors with their own orientation, right? So each grain actually sees a slightly different stress field surrounding it, depending okay. on the orientation. Using different grain interactions. Right. Okay. So it, it's on the, on the grain scale, it gets very quickly very complicated. Okay. Right? So we're measuring macroscopic behavior, basically. OK. So, um, you know, this was recognized early on that you have diffusion creep. You should each grain should change its shape, but uh, it turns out that that the grains don't do that, and that's super plasticity. If you go into material science literature, you can do extension to great um, strains. The grains themselves don't change shape. So the uh, model is that what actually happens is that you have di diffusionally accommodated grain boundary sliding. So diffusion creep implies that something more like this. So you have, as you can see here, an externally applied differential stress right, between sigma 1 and sigma 3. You can see the macroscopic change in the aggregate here, you know, elongate in this direction, after the deformation, elongate in this direction. But you can see here the individual grains don't change their shape. And the idea is that the, basically the grains slide past each other. And to make that possible, that's where the diffusion part comes in. Right? So diffusion creep means that you have some diffusion, as it's indicated here. Right? And you have stresses along the grain boundaries, di diffusion from those corners. But all that diffusion does, instead of changing the shape of the whole grain, is allows these grains to slide past each other so that you know, macroscopically, you have a shape change. You have, have imposed a strain. But microscopically, on the grain scale, um, the grain still retain the same shape. So yeah, and then it becomes even more complicated. Again, it comes all down to grain boundaries, how they behave, how the grain shapes actually behave, and so on. So when we have an empirical flow law that I showed earlier, th all of this happens. All of this, we think, is behind what we measure when we measure you know, strain rate as a function of stress, temperature, grain size, and so on. So. Oh, sorry. So can you actually observe this, you know, in the microscope? Now, you know, target one region and see how the grains get reorganized? That's uh, where it gets really complicated, right? Because we do these experiments at a confining pressure, in this case of 300 megapascal. Right? So, you know, equivalent to almost 10 kilometers or something like that. So we can't look at that directly. Um, and, and the other part is, of course, the high temperature. So. There are some analog experiments, but even that gets complicated. So as I said, um, Brian Evans and his student Alejandra Quintanillo, they have been doing experiments where they cut the sample, in this case, calcite. They're looking at calcite. Uh, they cut the sample open, then put a mesh on the sample where they can actually keep track of the individual positions, put the sample back together, deform it, take it apart again after deformation, and you know, look how the mesh has changed. And in that way, tracking internal deformation. But that's 
that's a very that's a lot of work. That's very complicated. That's a lot of work. So this is just the beginning. So we don't you know, again most of these models come from material science where things are a little bit easier to keep track of. So we're just starting, you know, with these earth materials basically to look at these kind of issues. And I'll show um, after I'm done with oh, sorry after I'm done with dislocation creep I'll show an uh, SEM image, you know, a few slides down the track here where you can start to see internal deformation. What's the scale on that, on that image? Is it 20 microns for each of those? So the scale here, that's the scale bar here is 20 microns. So the mean grain size here is around 5 micron or so. Really tiny mesh to put on, like, they did that on somewhat more coarser grains. So their mean grain size was maybe 30 micron or something like that, or even coarser. They used Carrara marble. I don't know on top of my head what the grain size of Carrara marble is. So more coarse grain than this, right, to make it easier. Yeah. It, is there a, a critical point where the uh, grain shapes do change? I'll show that. Okay. So, yes, yes. That's part of what we're going to discuss next. That's all diffusion creep. So when we do these experiments here, um, a figure from Greg Hirth, you know, stress as a, and then strain rate. So what I talked about here, here is the stress exponent again. Right? At low stresses and low strain rates, you have this linear or near linear behavior. And then you can see that you know, if you take a single sample and, and just continue to increase the stress on that sample, at some point you can see a steepening of the curve in this log stress, log strain, uh, log stress, log strain rate plot. And that steepening then is a transition in deformation mechanism. You go from linear or near linear diffusion or diffusionally accommodated uh, creep to dislocation creep, right? This is where the, the other defect comes in. Here um, we have a much more, uh, much stronger stress dependent, non-linear non stress dependent. Here that dashed line corresponds to n equals three and a half. That's sort of the canonical number for olivine in dislocation creep. Um, but for example, you know, calcite or ice this such a diagram would look considerably different and more complicated. So olivine, in that sense, seems to be a little bit more straightforward, although in recent times also there have been some complications, other um, exponents here. But the, the key part is that you transition with increasing stress, you know, constant temperature, constant grain size, everything else constant. All you're doing is increasing the stress, and you uh, transition into a different behavior, more strong uh, stress dependence of the strain rate. And again, I'm not going to go through the derivation of that flow law. There are actually many different uh, de derivations. Um, this, this one in particular is Wertman creep. Ideas, so all these different der derivations derive on or are based on the behavior of dis dislocations, right? We know that dislocations are generated by stress, right? So there's a feedback um, that feeds into uh, dislocation densities. And then the dislocations interact with each other. So dislocations are generated, but then they get stuck. So they get entangled, as you saw in, in these TM images. And then they have to free themselves from the entanglement by climbing. We discussed how an edge dislocation can climb out of its glide plane. So all of these models and everything you put together, glide velocities, um, which depends, again, on some constants and temperature. So temperature dependence comes back in, Burgers vector. So there's a range of different models for which you end up with a range of different uh, stress exponents in the end. Right? So the main part here is that if you look at this equation and think back at the diffusion creep equation, it looks very similar, except that here now stress explicitly has an exponent, and we saw that experimentally, right, that exponent is something for olivine, at least for coarse-grained olivine, something near three and a half. And um, the other part that's missing here is grain size dependence, right? So there is no grain size dependence in dislocation creep. And of course, that kind of makes sense. Dislocations are grain internal. They're generated grain internally. So it makes sense that there is no grain size dependence. That's the, those are the biggest difference. We have no grain size dependence, and we have this much more strong stress dependence in dislocation creep. So this is you know, recorded here. So the dislocation density um, is related to stress. Therefore, you get that nonlinear behavior. And then these dislocations occur intercrystalline, and so we have no grain size dependence. Yep. 
How do you um, uh, how do you measure the dislocation creep independent of your diffusion creep? Like so, in other words, those black dots that are below uh, the diffusion creep curve. So yeah, it's a good question. I didn't put that up. In the end, right, your total strain is the sum of, in this case, these two processes. So if you look at the where is so here you have the equation. I didn't write that down. You have the equation for um, dislocation creep. So in the end, right, your total strain is the contribution from diffusion creep plus the contribution from um, yeah dislocation creep, right? And so if you sorry, if you look at a curve like this. Essentially, you can see that you know here what is what Greg has done in this case is that he um, calculated a dislocation creep component and effectively subtracted that from the diffusion creep, right? So this is how you get your two dashed lines. So you do when you fit the data experimentally, you have to keep track of that, and you have to recognize that you know you have contributions from two different mechanisms. But you can see this is interesting for when we get to the deformation mechanism map. This transition here depends, you know, besides temperature, also on the grain size. So at constant temperature for each grain size, because uh, we have this very strong grain size dependence for diffusion creep, no grain size dependence for dislocation creep, the transition here um, depends uh, on grain size when you start to extrapolate. And um, then, of course, via the different, different activation energies, so each of these creep me mechanisms has a different activation energy, will depend also on uh, um, temperature. Right. But you have to separate the two components. But, but Uli, the, the black dots are a calculation then. So, yes, in the end, um, you have to basically, you know, when I fit the data to my, my creep data, you know, you have to fit it basically to the sum of both. So, or you can say that, right, you can see because of the very strong stress dependence here, you know, very quickly the contribution at low stresses, the contribution from dislocation creep becomes negligible, right? This is a log log plot, right? So that, you know, you just take the low stress data, you recognize it, you know, easily where you have contributions from dislocation creep. And then in the first instance, you know, just fit the diffusion creep, subtract that, and then fit the dislocation creep. So, ideally, you'd fit the entire flow, the entire data set to a combined flow law. Then you just have more parameters that you need to keep track of. So, it, I mean, it depends a little bit, right? The, the fitting and the errors that you get depends how much data you have. And typically, you know, we don't have huge amounts of data. So that's that's certainly something to keep in mind. So dislocation creep, right, this is then a deformation mechanism map. Right? As I said, we have these two different mechanisms and stress as a function of grain size. So the processes that happen, of course, is that during diffusion creep, you have grain growth. Grain growth, and I, I can't go into the details of grain growth either, but grain growth is driven by surface energy, right? The, the larger the grain, the more favorable the, the ratio of the surface energy to volume is, right? So Grain growth is driven, driven by a reduction in surface energy. So during diffusion creep, um, in parallel with the deformation, you have grain growth going on. In dislocation creep, as you generate dislocations, I mentioned that you generate subgrain boundaries. During dislocation creep, you recrystallize your aggregate. You eff effectively reduce the grain size. You put energy into dislocations due to the imposed deformation, and that reduces your grain size. So this is why. Um, you plot, you know, stress as a function of grain size. For small grain sizes, it makes sense. Diffusion is is fast enough to accommodate the imposed strain. But if you go to larger grain sizes, diffusion by itself, you know, larger grain sizes, or experimentally, if we increase the stress, right, we go in this direction experimentally. Um, grain growth would go in this direction. At some point, diffusion creep is no longer efficient enough. And you have to have the second mechanism. You have to have dislocation creep that accommodates the strain. That then leads to grain size reduction, right? And so, you know, there's a little bit more to it. But 
essentially you have these two competing mechanisms, one that drives you towards an increase in grain size and the other one that drives you towards a decrease in grain size. And there are ideas that essentially in the Earth then, because we always have deformation, but we always have grain growth driven by surface energy reduction, that we're sitting somewhere near this field boundary, right? That we're sitting near the transition between dislocation creep and diffusion creep because we always have these two competing processes going on. So that's a little bit, you know, thinking about grain sizes in the Earth or in planets. Um, those are the two mechanisms that, you know, determine the grain size. So you can't have, so the inner core is perhaps, I won't venture that far, but um, in the mantle, certainly in the silicate mantle, because you always have convection, we think, um, you always have grain size reduction due to uh, dislocation creep, right? You can't just grow a large single crystal. You generate lots of dislocations. You recrystallize it very quickly. Um, on the other hand, you know, uh, the grain size reduction only goes so far before grain growth becomes a force and increases the grain size again. So that, you know, very briefly. And the, the field boundary um, depends then on the relative activation energies, for example. That's a crucial part. So this is why it's important to measure these two. An indication which creep mechanism we have, and that's some, another topic that I won't go into any kind of detail, is that the only way to get seismic anisotropy, the only way to align olivine grains or any other grain so that it becomes, um, that you see an anisotropy is by dislocation creep. Right? Diffusion creep doesn't depend on the orientation in the first instance. Dislocation creep, because dislocations move on their glide planes, effectively when they move through the crystal, they're able to rotate it. And therefore, um, you can have lattice preferred orientation, which gives rise macroscopically to seismic anisotropy. We have, as we hear, seismic anisotropy, certainly in the upper mantle. And therefore, we think that we have dislocation creep for the most part as a dominant mechanism. Yeah. Oh, there's. So, can we pull samples from different pressures, maybe different mental denialists, and actually find that they plot onto this curve where we have a a relationship between the grain size and and perhaps the history of where it came from? So this is all experimental now, but do we find that on Earth? So if we so. You know, in the experiments, of course, we measure everything. You know, we measure temperature, we measure stress, we measure strain rate. Um, when you pick up a xenolith, you don't really know the conditions, temperature, or you know, the pressure or the strain rate stresses at which that xenolith or that peridotite body was deformed. So we have to make inferences. Um, you know, we can uh, try to calculate what the temperature and pressure were from different phases in the sample. We can look at things like grain size. So one of the things that's on here is um, a piezometric relationship. So there are attempts experimentally to look at, at what stress, what kind of grain size do you get. So you have a paleopiezometer that you can then apply and try to infer stress conditions. And people do that for shear zones, for example. So there are ways. But natural samples, uh, you know, there's always a little bit of a complication. And, you know, you have to start generating a database um, of, you know, a large number of observations. And people like uh, David Mainprice, Andrea Tomasi, for example, they're looking at fabrics a lot. And they, you know, trying to catalog the different fabrics and then corresponding conditions, for example. So, yes, ultimately, we'd like to, you know, translate what we measure experimentally on these natural observations. But... Okay. Uh, there are two ways to cause seismic anisotropy. One is lattice preferred orientation, and the other is shape preferred. Uh, so when you're talking about dislocation is related to seismic anisotropy, do you mean both or only the lattice preferred one? Only the lattice preferred orientation. So shape preferred orientation, the only way to get shape preferred orientation as you saw, diffusion creep, at least as far as we can tell experimentally, doesn't give you any shape-preferred orientation. In natural samples, going back to looking at prototypes, um, natural samples, the only time you have shape-preferred orientation, elongation of the grains, is when you have dislocation creep. So, you, you know, the shape-preferred orientation then okay. is related also to a rotation, to a, lat a lattice-preferred orientation. Okay. Or you could, you could have 
inclusions, uh, you know, shape with specific shapes, right? Right. So melt, if you align melt um, preferentially, that's one idea. You could generate um, anisotropy that way. But shape preferred orientation is also a macroscopic notion, right? Which you can get from layering. Right. If you have, yes. Um, so if you have layers um, on enough distributed layer, you could also get anisotropy. That's true. Yep. Um. Are you going to talk about green boundary sliding and what sets the size of that field? So green boundary sliding, yes, of course. This green boundary sliding field, um, there is, so we already know that we have, well, we know from, you know, the theoretical model, we have green boundary sliding here, what I call diffusion creep, is this, uh, you know, regime where the deformation is actually due to green boundary sliding that's accommodated by diffusion. In this field, the idea is that you have green boundary sliding accommodated by dislocations. That's still, um, in my mind at least, not entirely settled because one of the things is we don't image any dislocations on the grain boundaries, right? On the, in, I showed all of the grain boundaries. We don't actually see any dislocations. There is clearly in the experimental data, there are indications that there's a transition between this location creep field and this and then another field that's separate from the diffusion creep. So here in this field, you have a grain size dependence, but you have a nonlinear, more strongly nonlinear um, stress dependence. Yeah, so, you know, that's another complication. As you can see here, you know, if you extrapolated this to the Earth, at, at least at face value, what's plotted here with the parameters that are in the literature for grain boundary sliding, diffusion creep, and dislocation creep, right? Stresses, this is one megapascal here, so stresses in the convecting upper mantle, you know, would be one megapascal or less, so that, you know, you wouldn't transition into this field or into the spirals creep field that, you know, they're here at fairly high stresses. But that's certainly, that's an issue that we haven't quite resolved yet experimentally. We still don't quite understand everything that's going on. Uh, from this figure, we can see that the, actually the grain size cannot grow too small or grow too large. Uh, is it fair to say that uh, both diffusion and dislocation creep could almost, yeah, uh, coexist all the time? Quite likely. I mean, quite likely, especially if we're, we think we're sitting somewhere near the field boundary, you'd have a contribution from both mechanisms. You typically just have one that's dominant, that's producing most of the strain. But quite likely we have, you know, if we're sitting really in, in diffusion creep, um, we have a little bit of dislocation action, basically, that contributes to the total strain, and also here in this dislocation creep regime. Yep. So that's the uh, right... Uh, is a change from dislocation to diffusion a very rapid process or very slowly so it changes the viscosity slowly or rapidly? Well, yeah, one thing I forgot to mention, that's a good point here, these are contours of constant strain rate, right? You can see that these contours are um, very different. Here, of course, they're independent of, of grain size. Here, they're strongly dependent on grain size. So the, you know, here is the strain rate of 10 to the minus 12. You can see, again, you know, that corresponds to what I said, the stresses in the convecting upper mantle are, you know, were somewhere down here and lower, you know, slower strain rates. So there isn't, there wouldn't be a sudden transition, right? That's, it's, it, it's much more. So in that sense, you're right, this map is a little bit deceptive in that there's a sharp boundary, but this certainly isn't the case. You know, there isn't a sudden it's not a phase transition in that sense, right? It's a very, very, very broad transition from one dominating to the other dominating. Yeah. Okay. So, so very, you know, briefly. Um, so this is an electron backscatter diffraction map where one of the samples that I showed earlier in an SEM image of has been mapped on each point on this map corresponds to a full crystallographic orientation. This is one of the relatively exciting um, techniques that have come up in the last few years or have really come so that we can map samples now, not just compositionally, but also the orientation. And you can see here, so the colors here correspond to different grain orientations. 
So the uh, SEM image that I showed had these very nice hexagonal grains, but you can see here it's much more complicated, right? These grains, so here this pinkish one um, has other grains growing into it. You can see the red one here is, you know, growing all over the place. So this is, um, yeah, this is this sample has been deformed in dislocation creep. So, and in this dislocation creep regime, all of a sudden, not only do we have dislocations active, but the grain boundaries uh, in this particular in instance have become much more mobile, right? So you had recrystallization going on due to the dislocations, but not only recrystallization that the grain, all grains have become smaller, they also have intergrown with each other. And then, you know, very briefly, here this map shows grain internal strain, and you can see that this, these stripes here, so this is one grain, right? This is one orientation, but you can already see here that there are slightly different shades of pink. And that corresponds, um, you can see that here more clearly, to subgrain boundaries. So we have grain internal deformation expressed by these subgrain boundaries. And then these, where these colors change fairly rapidly, you have more grain internal strain, right? The orientation at this point changes um, relatively rapidly um, within one grain. So these are just a few degrees. Remember, this is where we go back to the definition of a grain boundary. These black lines here, what we call a grain, basically has a misorientation of greater than 10 degrees. Everything that's internal here has a misorientation of less than 10 degrees. Right. Yeah? Do you have a more um, intuitive way of, of describing how we can have grain size reduction when we're in uh, this, this regime? So, starting with a big crystal and having first, do you imagine it being first a few mismatches in orientation versus strain and then that grain itself will break up, this big pink grain will break up into equal domains? Or is there a different description for, it, for these parts where they're really tiny? I mean, that doesn't look like it's coming from the same. So the mechanism in the end, that's another issue that we're in, there are models for how this recrystallization occurs. But again, it's more complicated. So one way to do that is by generating subgrain boundaries. And then you accumulate more and more dislocations in these subgrain boundaries, meaning that you have more and more of a rotation, you know, grain internally. And at some point, you have enough dislocations in a subgrain boundary that, you know, basically that's then a separate grain boundary, right? If your misorientation becomes too large, you transition from a subgrain boundary to a grain boundary, right? That's one way you can see that here right, in these, you know, the colors again indicate that that you can imagine if this increases or this continues to accumulate subgrains, eventually this becomes a, a grain boundary, right, with the change in properties. So that's one way basically forming subgrain boundaries and these continue to rotate. The other part is here that you can see that the, the crystals themselves, so the grain boundaries become mobile, they interpenetrate, and then at some point, right, this you know, maybe in the third dimension, this patch here has a connection to this grain, but eventually it'll be separate and be its own grain, its own separate grain. So those are, you know, as far as you can see here in these maps mechanisms that contribute to a grain size reduction. But again, that's something, you know, which one is active? Yeah, there's still quite a bit more experimental work to be done to, to really pin that down. And also looking at natural rocks, you see very similar processes in natural rocks. So it makes a surprisingly high fractal index on uh, this scale. Can you correlate this fractality with the age of your rock? I mean, this is an experimental sample, so, uh, oh, okay. right, so, uh, you know, this, I forgot, I think that's been deformed at 1250 degrees C you know, at the end at relatively high stresses. So it, it would be it would be a little bit difficult to do that. Um, yeah, so people haven't looked at fractality of these um, images yet. That's as I said, I mean these kind of, this this mapping is only is relatively recent that we can actually do that. So that's something, you know, we might think about. All right, so I have to speed up a little bit. Still got a few more things. So very briefly, the influence of melt on rheology. Right. Uh, so this is a fully, again, a fully synthetic aggregate. I think I might have showed that earlier. You can see grain boundaries here. 
uh, to a one nanometer size. And then here is a triple junction, three grains coming together. And from this TEM image, here's the scale bar, there's essentially nothing at the triple junction in this fully synthetic aggregate. If you take a natural crystal, crush it up, and San Carlos, a lot of the peridot um, that you can buy, for example, is jewelry, that's a source um, for this gem quality material. The stuff that isn't quite gem quality, that's sold to scientists and we use it to break it up and do experiments with. The problem is, the reason why it's not quite gem quality is because it's not very pure, for example. It has inclusions or other things in it. If you take that then, this, these are xenoliths originally, take it up to high pressure, so 12, 1300 degrees where you deform these, the impurities form a tiny melt fraction. You can see that here, right? The scale bar is 20 nanometers. So again, three grains here. And you can see very nicely that this place where there was nothing before in the synthetic aggregate is filled by melt. And you know, here the scale bar changing in 200 nanometers, so this is a larger melt pocket. It's a little bit blurry. But basically, um, we can introduce melt either in these natural samples. You always get a very small melt fraction. It's very difficult to avoid that. Or we can deliberately add melt to these fully synthetic olivines and see what happens um, when we do the same deformation as experiments as before. We have to know a little bit more about the melt distribution, just a little aside here. So melt distribution in polycrystalline or olivine, again, experimentally determined here. You can see that this is a piston cylinder experiment. So this is a static experiment at 1 GPA, 1350 degrees C. And that the advantage of a piston cylinder versus the deformation rigs is that we can let things sit around, not for geologic time scales, but still for hundreds of hours or weeks, basically, and let grain growth happen in particular in this case. And that grain growth then determines the melt distribution. And you can see the melt. So again, you can see a little bit of orientation contrast. So darker olivine. These are all olivine grains that have exactly the same composition. That's orientation, the difference in grayscale. In between here, you can see melt. right? And at this scale, that's a relatively low magnification image, you can see that you have these large pockets of melt. But then everywhere where these double arrows are, it turns out when you zoom in at high magnification, you have actually a wetted grain boundary. So there's melt on a grain boundary. And I've blown this up here, this little square where you can, can't really see much of anything at this, this resolution here. You can see very nicely that you have a wetted grain boundary, right? these three grain edges here, three grain edges here. But that's connected by a layer of melt. Uh, yeah, I'm just curious, why, what, why have these, these look so three-dimensional? Is there like a simple? I imagine there's some simple reason for that, or three dimensions. Like these pictures, they they like. I mean, it looks like the olive olivine grains are like high, and the little melt pockets are oh, kind of low. So here, the edges here. Yeah. Right? So it, that's a that's a if you want an artifact of the sample preparation, right? We we in order to see that, we we cut the sample open, and then you know at this scale, right? You have to polish it, in order certainly in order to see this orientation contrast, we have to polish it. And we polish that very, so the idea also, if you do EBSD, for example, you need a very high quality surface. Yeah. The polishing then, because the glass, the quenched melt is softer, the polish removes a bit more of the glass than uh -huh. it does of the olivine. If you look very carefully, actually, the olivine, how well it polishes also depends on orientation. So you can see topography even on the olivine grains, because certain orientations are harder than other orientations. So yeah. <coughs> how this melt forms and then migrates in the time scale over which these textures develop? Are we melting uniformly on grain boundaries, then the melt is moving towards these triple junctions? No. So uh, these are experiments. So yeah. the way we prepare these samples is we take olivine, and then we mix a basalt with the olivine. Right? The, the melting temperature of olivine only, you know, phosphorite is somewhere 1,800 degrees or something like that. So the melt. And the, the melt, this is basaltic melt. The melt composition is designed such that if you reduce the temperature to, say, 1250 degrees C, you start crystallizing orth orthopyroxene and eventually clinopyroxene. So the melt is near saturation with a full four-phase lazulite. And the melt is mechanically mixed at the beginning of the experiment. And the crucial part to get this kind of distribution, even at this time scale, is that you start out with a very fine-grained olivine. So the, the grain size, the starting grain size of the olivine is about a micron or so. 
and then you know the mechanical mixing isn't perfect and actually if you start too coarse grained i don't have that here but you can see that um, you have what you see even over a lot of times is an imperfect mixing so the key is that you start very fine grain so that you have a lot of grain growth the mean grain size increases from one micron or so to 30 micron in this case and that grain growth redistributes the melt and you get to some sort of steady state in terms of surface energy right of the melt distribution and the grain size distribution so yeah so essentially the melt doesn't form in that sense as it does in an upwelling mid-ocean ridge but again keeping time scales in mind right so you know one of the points here is that this allows very rapid diffusion so the melt has no problem moving to where surface energy wants it to move basically so in this aggregate and that's one of the key points you have to let these run for a long time to see a steady state distribution of the melt and this steady state distribution is characterized by these wetted grain boundaries and there was some discussion in the literature whether these are actually wetted grain boundaries or whether these are you know one of these triple junctions sectioned along axis right? you can imagine the triple junctions are almost cylinders except for their, their shape so if you section one of those tips along axis you would also get an apparently wetted grain boundary what we've done, and Gordana has done that, actually, I don't know where she is, that's part of her PhD work, um, did this serial sectioning in high resolution imaging. The layers here and the depth is refers to the original surface, and then we keep polishing through. So these are different layers at which we uh, took the sample out of the polisher and imaged it uh, down to 20 micron here from starting from 3 micron, and you can trace that wetted grain boundary very nicely you can see here is an opx grain or the pyroxene grain um, in the middle of the olivine grain so the olivine grew around it and you can trace this grain through and eventually it disappears you can see that these large pockets here change fairly rapidly whereas the wetted grain boundary persists between these grains so this is really in three dimensions a wetted grain boundary so at this these conditions we have wetted grain boundaries in olivine and that looks pretty exciting when you then reconstruct this for example here this is a large olivine grain you can see that it's not completely but to a large degree at this melt fraction here at 3.6 percent it's surrounded by melt yeah this might be a stupid question but um you said in the sap that the that the in the sample prep you're polishing and therefore removing preferentially the areas where there are melt how do you know you're not also preferentially removing the grain boundaries and that that's what you're seeing rather than necessarily having removed the melt? So let me go back. So here in this one, this is a nice example, right? This is just a blow up of this area here. Where the white dots are, you can see that here, there are grain boundaries. Right? And you can clearly see that you can't see anything, right? So where there's a melt-free grain boundary, um, the uh, polishing doesn't touch the aggregate the the only time you you get this removal of material is where you actually have melt there and we, we've so you know there's more to it we've looked at this with tm and all sorts of other ways with tm you see the same thing you would be saying a silicate here where the you know the, the thinning mechanism is different um, you'd see a silicate you basically see a melt here you don't see th this is where the um, high resolution images i showed earlier one of those is from a grain boundary like that so yeah no, no, I mean, these are all concerns, but, you know, so that's, yeah. And at 3.6% melt fraction, you see no evidence of the melt. You see no evidence of the melt trying to segregate and rise to the top, or do you? No, so, you know, we won't get, so this is a piston cylinder experiment. The sample is about 2 millimeter in size. So gravity, essentially, if you do the calculations, won't segregate the melt. Right? It's, it's not surface energy will hold the melt in place. Well, yeah. I mean, but that, that's a key thing that surface energy will, because that's the competition. And surface energy versus gravity, right? Right, but in the mantle, of course, you have, you know, density yeah. integrated over a larger melting column, right? Uli, that serial sectioning, I know, is a ton of work, and I just commend yes. you. It's, um, yes. I, don't, I don't want people to appreciate how much work probably went into making that image that you showed. Um, how... Now we're seeing a lot of um, tomography 
in in the business, in the rheology business? And what are the experimental changes you need to make to be able to see, for example, with X-ray tomography or synchrotron tomography, to see the olivine melt? You know, um, do you, you need a larger Z contrast or? Yeah, I mean the problem is, with is serial sectioning something that we're going to need to continue doing. I guess is my question. The the problem is right. So most of these layers are, have a thickness, you know, especially if you subtract, you know, the edge effects here of about 100 nanometers or so. And but also the triple junction. If you look in detail, you can see that some of these triple junction are, you know, a micron or less. So the resolution um, with X-ray tomography is about 700 nanometers. That's sort of the resolution limit. So you can't resolve, especially these wetted grain boundaries, you can't resolve them at this scale. And there is very little that you can do, right? It's the x-ray contrast between the basalt and the olivine isn't great to start with. And then, you know, you just, you just don't have the resolution. So in published work, essentially these, these wetted grain boundaries, you know, aren't resolved. Um, for X-ray tomography. So the only way to, this is partly why we did the serial sectioning, because you can actually resolve the wetted grain boundaries. Uh, you can't, um, if you look at X-ray tomographic images at this melt fraction, you wouldn't get nearly as many, many uh, wetted grain boundaries. Right? I mean, we're trying, you know, one idea is to dope the melt with a heavy element like niobium that has a good X-ray contrast, and we're working on that, but even then it's, you're still struggling with resolution. That's the beauty of the um, field emission SEM imaging that you have really nice resolution. But of course, yes, it's a hell of a lot of work. And you can see the artifacts, you know, from assembling it, you know, one more difficulty is to rectify the image with depth. These ripples here essentially are, you know, where we haven't stacked the images perfectly. But I, I mean, in my opinion, tomography isn't there um, to resolve low melt fractions. This is, at high melt fractions, you know, the two methods converge. But we want to know if we think that the melt fractions in the mantle are very low, we have to image the low melt fractions. Okay. So were these hand polished or were these fibbed? I'm sorry? Were these hand polished or fibbed? No, these are hand polished. That's another issue, right? If you look at the scale here, that's about 200 micron or so. So with the fib, you just you'd sit there forever to do anything. So these are hand polished. You need a large area, too. Right. I mean, these, this, each, so each of these layers here consists of 16 images, right? It's a mosaic of 16 individual images, uh, right? So, so 36 images are, you know, put together for each layer um, and assembled in this way. So, for each layer, yeah. And there are, I don't know, there are 30. How many layers did you put together? 26 layers, yeah. So it's, yeah. <laughs> yes, and every time you have to, of course, polish. I mean, yeah, there is depth measurement. We actually drilled a laser hole and used um, reflective, the, the reflection from the bottom of the laser hole to measure the depth, you know, how much we remove material. So there's a lot more to it, but. Is that how you, is that how you um, are sure that you? A lot for alignment, you know, yeah. this is where the yes. wiggles come. So that's from. how you ensure planarity, because if you're polishing off a very small amount and you're like not, and you're polishing at an We had two laser holes, so we can measure, okay, that's what I was wondering. measure the depth in both of those holes. Yeah, make sure that we don't cant the sample. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, sorry, I have to, I'm happy to, or Gordon, I can answer more questions about this as well. So, uh, influence melt rheology, if we then take these fully synthetic aggregates, um, that's the re rheology shown here, and we start to add melt to it, or we just have a melt from using natural samples, we get a substantial weakening of the samples here. So here, log stress versus log strain rate, you can see that you know, for the same temperature, um, here the green, for example, 1250 degrees, where most of this data is at, um, there's a substantial weakening of the sample, much higher strain rates when melt is present. And you know, thinking a little bit why that could be, in these samples, essentially, we said, you know, this is all diffusion creep data, uh, near linear. We have diffusion along the grain boundaries, but the melt, all of a sudden, as soon as you have a little bit of melt, and this is really a little bit of melt, you have very fast diffusion pathways. So your diffusivities all of a sudden go up by 
you know, corresponding orders of magnitude. So this is one and a half to two orders of magnitude that the samples become weaker, and that's due to the enhanced diffusivity um, due to the presence of melt. So we have these short circuit pathways along three grain edges, so you still have to diffuse from the interior of a grain boundary to, to here, the triple junction, but then you can zoom along in the melt. And that enhances, that weakens the sample because you can diffuse that much faster. And uh, this is now, yeah, this initially, you know, there were some questions about this, but this is now confirmed theoretically as well by m models, for example, by um, Yasuko Taka and Ben Holtzman, where they've looked at this theoretically plotted as normalized shear viscosity versus melt fraction. Here, this is melt free. And then you can see that for the first percent, you have a very dramatic, in this case, order of magnitude reduction in the strength of the sample just by introducing a small amount of melt. So does the presence of melt shift um, the boundary between diffusion and huh. dislocation creep in that phase That's diagram? an interesting, that's, yeah, it gets a little bit more complicated. Yes, it should, right? If you enhance, so if you think about that, <laughs> dislocations are grain internal. They don't see the melt. So they're not affected by the presence of melt. Diffusion creep you know, involves diffusion on the outside of the grains. So that should shift the uh, deformation mechanism map over. That's correct. Except we run into all sorts of experimental problems there in that, yeah, we have to use very fine-grained aggregates to get diffusion creep in the first place. So there, there's still things that we need to work on. That's correct. But that's, that's good thinking. Yep. So. Okay, I really wanted to get to this part as well. So essentially, all we've talked about is, you know, these very large strains. So epsilon, you know, on convective um, scales, of course, strain is much larger than one. So steady state deformation, where the um, stress that we have imposed leads to a steady state microstructure um, and these very large long time scales, and we have steady state deformation. Just as important in the Earth, and this is from Ewan and Peltier in 1982, here's time in seconds, right? Convection, you can see here somewhere, you know, m many uh, orders of magnitude here in terms of um, convective time scales. You can certainly go all the way over here, so where you have a time scale of one second, and that's somewhere where seismic wave propagation happens. And then you have all sorts of things happening in between normal modes, tides, um, post-placial rebound, um, post-seismic deformation, that is somewhere in between in these, in, in the time scale, you know, time scale of seconds here to time scale of convective time scale millions of years. And we have to look there for a deformation at a range of time scales. We can't just look at um, this picture and try to infer what that means for seismic wave propagation. We actually have to measure deformation at seismic time scales. And that's what I'll spend on a little bit of time trying to um, give some background to that. So these microcreep experiments, and again, you know, strains here now are very small, of order 10 to the minus 4 or less. Um, and that's, you know, the experiment here is you apply a st uh, step function in, in stress for a certain amount of time, and then you re take the stress off and you watch or record the strain. So the axis here, that's strain, this is time. And what you can see is that the step function stress corresponds to a step function in strain. Right? And you could start thinking about it. If you have a spring right, and you compress that, the response will be, for all intents and purposes, instantaneous. Then it gets interesting because you have a fairly rapid um, strain rate that then becomes shallow. You can sort of see the changing curve. And in particular, you can see that here. Here, when you release the stress, you get, you know, compress the spring. I'll get to that. Um, you get the, the spring strain back immediately, but then you can see that you know, there is something happening for quite a long time afterwards. So these microcreep experiments tell us something about the processes that happen on these intermediate time scales. And that's what I'll explain. And that's related, of course, to attenuation or dissipation because a propagating seismic wave uh, over time or a propagation time or propagation distance loses amplitude due to this attenuation. And that's related, of course, to this deformation here. Right? So I'll try to explain that a little bit where that comes from. The experiments are done in torsion, where you uh, either as a step function or sinusoidally uh, torque the sample. Here's the sample. Um, here, yeah, it, 
the experiments are a bit more complicated. You have an elastic standard. The interesting part is we can do the experiments at mantle temperatures, at seismic periods, one to 1,000 seconds. And then the confining pressure, this is pretty low pressure, that's really there to make sure that these interfaces that we have in the assembly don't slip relative to each other. And from the resultant strains, the time lag, we can essentially measure the shear modulus, so the spring constant, and we can measure the energy loss, this attenuation, and I'll say more about that. So just very briefly, I have to go through this very quickly. So Hooke's law, we saw that already step function in stress leads to you know, a strain like this. As soon as you apply the stress, you get strain. The strain persists as long as you apply the stress. If you let go, no more strain. Um, it gets interesting then if you start thinking about viscous behavior. So a dash pot you know, up here basically pushes spoon into honey. And you know, so you start pushing, so that's the stress. The strain will accumulate over time, right? You can't, you know, given honey that's viscous enough, has a high enough viscosity, it takes time to push the spoon into it. And that's essentially what we're doing here. So while we're pushing, we keep accumulating strain. If we stop pushing, you know, again, assuming that gravity, so taking gravity out of the picture, the spoon will stay where you left it in the, in the pot of honey. So the strain has accumulated. As soon as you stop pushing, you don't get any further strain, but you don't get it back. That's the big difference to the spring where you get the strain back, right? And uh, so that's constant then. If you put that together, um, that's m a lot of people will model the Earth as a Maxwell body, the combination of elastic behavior. So lithosphere is rigid. You know, that's where you have the earthquakes. And then the convective part here is this dash pot. And the combined application of stress, if you look at, again, a step function in stress, the strain, of course, is instantaneous here from the spring. And then as you keep pushing, you get more and more strain due to the deformation of the dash pot. When you let go, essentially you remove the stress, you get the elastic part back, but the viscous part is permanent. Right? So that's Maxwell behavior, and it works you know, explaining earthquakes on the one hand and convective behavior on the other hand. But you can't really explain this intermediate behavior here. Right? This is not captured. So the Maxwell body would capture the elastic part here and would capture you know, long-term deformation here. But this change in strain rate isn't captured by the Maxwell body. For this, we need analastic behavior. This is transient creep. So there are various different names, analastic, transient. Um, you'll hear analastic very often. You can see that we've gotten a little bit more creative with our springs and dash pots. We've got a spring and a dash pot instead of in series. We have that in parallel. So we have a parallel uh, or in, uh, organization of this. If you push on here, of course, the spring wants to respond instantaneously, but it's delayed by the dash pot. Right? So you can't push instantaneously. It takes time, just like for the dash pot by itself. But the difference is that you know, at some point, the applied stress is balanced by the, string, by the spring, so you won't have any further strain. Right? So there is a maximum of strain that you can get to to where the spring balances the externally applied stress. So the stress time curve looks a bit more complicated. You know, essentially, you have an accumulation of strain that at some point reaches the maximum. And then when you let go, because of the spring, you get everything back. You get your whole strain back. But it takes time to get that back. You don't get it back instantaneously. And that's, if you put all of this together, that's where you have a, what's called a Burgers model Right, so the Maxwell elements, the spring in the dash pot here, and together with this analastic um, element, you get behavior that starts to look like the experiments, where you have an instantaneous elastic strain followed by a transient, fairly rapid strain, and then you have a steady state creep. And that's, again, something similar to what I had earlier here. The, the total strain, of course, is the sum of the elastic, the transient, and the fully viscous strain. And in terms of recoverability, so the steady state creep, that's the normal convection, that's irrecoverable. But the transient strains, these are all recoverable, meaning if you let go, you get all of these strains back because you have the uh, dash pots here. And if you translate that to time scales, right, so elastic behaviors, earthquakes obviously is brittle, um, but that's on the elastic time scale instantaneous, seismic waves, you know, here in that analastic region, and then post-glacial rebound, depending a little bit where you are, what temperature you are at, you're transitioning from you know, transient behavior 
to steady state creep behavior. But you can see, right, if you estimate viscosities for, from, from the Earth, from post-glacial rebound, and you have an enhanced strain rate because at some point you're in the analastic part, you'll get this analastic viscosity, but you don't get the steady state viscosity necessarily. So there's a little bit of a complication here um, that needs to be taken into account. And essentially, this is partly what we're thinking about with our experiments. If, as you'll, I'll show some experimental data a little bit, essentially we have to fit our data to a Burgers model like this, right? So the more simple constitutive equation for a Maxwell element won't do. We need to take the transient part into account. And then, um, yes, the equations, I have to show some equations, get a little bit more complicated. So here's the elastic part, here's the viscous part, and then we have this transient creep term here um, that all of these data, all of these parameters, essentially, we have to determine in our experiments. Um, do you have a simple um, physical explanation for that transient part? I'll get to that, okay. hopefully. <laughs> so yes, that's an important point. Um, so I just want to set the stage a little bit, and then I'll, I'll, I'll try to look at microphysical models. So, so time domain, but then you know, uh, seismic waves, we think about it in the frequency domain. So you can translate Fourier transform or, or Laplace transform, everything in the frequency domain. And you get a real and an imaginary part for seismic wave propagation. The real part um, here, the imaginary part here, and then the shear modulus and attenuation. So shear modulus, the, the, basically the, the spring, um, and then the uh, energy loss here. These are just combinations of the real and the imaginary parts that we determine in these experiments. So staying a little bit simple still, so if we, we can calculate this, here's the time domain part that, that I already showed, the elastic, the analastic, the viscous. In the frequency domain, so you have to watch the time scale. I switch around here as well. So time increases to the right. Uh, here on this part, time increases to the left, essentially. Here we have high frequencies. Here we have low frequencies. So initially, when you look at this whole model and you start pushing on it very fast, essentially you just see the elastic part. Eventually, you start seeing the transient part here. This is the increase here, this analastic part, right, where you're pushing on both springs and you start to see this dash pot. When you move the dash pot a maximum amount, this is when you have this peak in attenuation. That's the loss here. Then, you know, as you move it slower and slower, the viscous resistance, right, becomes insignificant. You know, if you push slow enough, the viscosity is low enough, you don't really notice much of a resistance. So the, the, the energy loss due to this dash pot goes down. But then at some point, right, the other dash pot kicks in, and you start you know, deforming mostly this dash pot. And that's your viscous behavior. And the, the dissipation here, the attenuation of the energy then goes, so 1 over uh, Q is the dissipation, goes by 1 over the frequency. So that's, that's basically then Maxwell behavior again, right? So for a Maxwell body, that's essentially, you take this out, that's what you would see. So going back to the microcreep curves, right? So we can now, as we saw, right, we can, with this simple model, we can reproduce these microcreep curves. But then, um, you know, just an aside, yeah, I won't go into great details. There's another model, end rate model, looks very similar. The problem is this is the transient term, and that this transient term gives rise to a fairly different behavior. In particular, the transient term contributes indefinitely. So we think that the end rate model isn't a very good model to fit this kind of creep data. You can locally fit it, but for extrapolation, we think that it's not suitable. So how does this data look like? Um, here's shear modulus as a function of oscillation uh, period, so period here, one second, a thousand seconds, so time increases to the right. These colors here indicate different temperatures. So what we have is we measure the shear modulus here as a function of temperature for one fixed grain size. And you can see that the, as a, if you, you know, fix your period here, the shear modulus decreases for this fine grain size quite dramatically as you increase temperature. And that's, of course, very similar that you saw already in uh, the creep experiments. As temperature increases, the samples become weaker. So that corresponds here, temperature increase, the shear modulus decreases. But you can s clearly see also the frequency dependence, right? At high frequencies here, you have a higher shear modulus. So if you sit at 1,200 degrees, for example, 
the shear modulus here at one second period, one hertz, is quite high. At 1,000 seconds, it's considerably, considerably lower. So nothing else happens. The only thing that we change, so grain size, temperature, everything else is the same. The only difference is that we're now torquing it much, much slower, right, at a 1,000 second period rather than one second period. So you can see there's a very strong uh, frequency dependence here in, in the shear modulus data. And then if you measure samples with different grain sizes, so here's 3 micron, here's 23 micron, you can see again at 1,200 degrees, this sample here with the coarser grain size has a much higher shear modulus for everything else being equal, right? Same temperature, same period. Um, so here, 100 seconds, you have to go to 100 seconds here. The core, more coarse grain sample is stronger than the more fine grain sample. So this goes to what the mechanism is. I'll get back to that. So if you look at dissipation, that's the corresponding. So we measure both modulus and dissipation. If you look at dissipation, again, function of temperature and a similar behavior at, you know, if you fix a temperature here, say 900 degrees, at high frequencies, we have the lowest loss. At low frequencies, we have the highest loss. So the shear modulus decreases and energy corresponding, the two go together, of course, the energy loss increases. And you can see these are nice constant line. So here I have an exponent, right? So a frequency exponent, essentially, if you fit this data, the lines are essentially a fit to the data. We have a frequency exponent, um, and that's what we call, I might refer to that as the high temperature background. You can see that in the experiments very nicely. Different samples at different grain sizes have essentially the same slope in this dissipation versus period space. And that's experimentally very well constrained, that slope. This slope is around, um, it's a little less than one third. Again, comparing uh, two different samples and uh, 1,200 degrees here, for example, 100 seconds, the more fine-grained sample is more lossy. The more coarse-grained sample is less lossy at keeping everything else the same, temperature and frequency. So again, there's a very clear grain size dependence of the dissipation mechanism. Right? And yes, of course, it gets a little bit more complicated in order to use the Burgers model to fit that, we actually have to fit a distribution of relaxation times. We don't just have a single peak, as I showed for the simple Burgers model. In effect, we have to put many di uh, dash pots and springs in parallel together, sum them all up or integrate them in order to make this constant um, high temperature background absorption band. So very briefly. Um, so the physical model, how do we account for the behavior that we see? We saw the grain size dependence. We see the temperature dependence. And we see different frequency regimes. I won't go into great detail here. This broad region with the mild frequency dependence, this is really, we think, the important one. This is this here. We can see a steepening here, right? So mechanism probably changes. We can also see that something else happens down here. We again go to a near, near zero slope. So all of this needs to be um, accommodated in a fit to the data. It needs to be explained. And this is where we go back to grain boundaries. We think that everything is grain boundaries. And the grain size dependence really is the strongest hint. We need to account for that grain size dependence. And if we actually fit our data, we can fit it with a grain size dependence. Right? We need to include a grain size dependence. And the uh, background is that, again, we have grain boundaries sliding, very similar to what we had in diffusion creep. The grain boundary is very important. And I pulled out one, this is an ab initio model of an olivine, just very briefly. You can see that there is um, a misorientation between these lattice planes. And the model predicts that you sort of have a more disordered region um, here in the grain boundary. But this is a very, still a very simplified, it's a symmetric tilt boundary. I said you have a distribution of misorientation, so this is still a bit idealized. But something like that happens here at the grain boundary. What we need is the grain size, the grain boundary width, which we have from the TM images, right, about nanometer here, um, the grain boundary viscosity, that's what we're measuring actually directly, and then grain boundary diffusivity. What happens if you apply um, a stress, right, macroscopically, you can see we apply a shear stress, the grains rotate a little bit. You get stress concentrations at grain corners while the grain boundary slides. And that's what we call elastically accommodated grain boundary sliding. 
the viscous sliding of grains, and the material science, scientists call that grain boundary spectroscopy because they say we measured basically the grain boundary viscosity, this one nanometer. We measure that directly. Um, and the time scale of the sliding is given by this grain boundary viscosity, the grain size modulus, and then the grain boundary width. So this is um, analastic behavior, recoverable, right? Analastic is recoverable, and this results in a dissipation peak. At least that's what's predicted. That's, so then you end up with stress concentration at grain corners. We know that stress concentration drive diffusion. So the next thing that happens is now this diffusionally assisted uh, sliding where stress concentration here lead to diffusion and so the grain uh, boundaries essentially can slide a little bit further. Um, again, this is a transient process because you still have stress concentration and this generates essentially, we think the high temperature background, this constant frequency uh, exponent of 0.3 or near 0.3 because it, the longer we apply the stress, the further we get uh, diffusing along grain boundaries and redistributing the overall stress. Right, so the, the previous process gives us a peak. This one here gives us a very broad uh, deformation, transient deformation regime in time scale due to ever increasing diffusion. And then eventually the other interesting part is this transitions into macroscopic, if we keep this up long enough, we transition into diffusionally accommodated sliding. That's the normal process for diffusion creep. And that's been around here. Um, there are several models, several uh, work that look at this. So the initial part is this here, the end of the elastically accommodated grain boundary sliding. And this is the um, stress distribution for diffusion creep. So this process, these three processes change the stress distribution. And these two here are transient processes. This is the enhanced creep rate that we see in the experiments, the enhanced so that the faster deformation rate in comparison to the steady state diffusion creep. And once we're here, we keep the stress distribution constant. We just keep pushing. That's the permanent viscous st strain. Everything here, if we let go, we reverse the process again by diffusion, and we get essentially the strain back that we put in. Early on the previous slide, why is the strain recoverable? Uh, essentially, case? right. So, you know, that's the after the end of elastically accommodated sliding, you have this kind of. Um, well, the tractions here, the stress distribution, basically. The stress distribution slowly changes until you're here. But when you let go, um, what happens is that you reverse the whole process. right? You go from this kind of stress distribution at the center of the grains back to a stress distribution here at the grain boundaries, and eventually that stress distribution. So you're basically undoing all the deformation driven by this non-homogeneous stress distribution. right? And that's why it's reversal, It's a reversible process. Right? These are the springs, essentially, that, that you compress. So you, you know, in the end, you want to have uniform stresses. Here, the stress is non-uniform. And you reverse this process until you know, here, that's elastically accommodated grain boundary sliding. So then you slide your grain boundaries back, driven by this stress, and you have zero stress. Because the deformation is small or doesn't last long or, I mean... Yeah, in effect, I mean, the strains that you get out of this are very, very small. Right? These are very small strains uh, in comparison to steady state strains. I mean, the, the experiments are done at strains of 10 to the minus 5 or so. Right? We're talking very, very, so near, you know, atomic scale sometimes strains. Uh, the, the model is somewhat idealized, but we can see that we, I didn't show that, we, we can see the recovering, right? If we take the stress off, we can see that the strain goes away, except for the viscous strain, right? So we can verify that experimentally. So putting that together, uh oh. Um, so here, this is this elastically accommodated grain boundary sliding here. So frequency, short times, long times. Here, this is this transient behavior um, with that slope alpha that we see experimentally. And then we transition into viscous behavior. So in particular, the grain size dependence you know, is different here in this regime. We have a linear grain size dependence, even though it's a diffusive process. But because the diffusion, di diffusion distances, diffusion doesn't occur over the whole grain. It always only occurs over part of the grain. So we have this alpha that modifies our grain size dependence that otherwise should be cubic. Right? That's what we saw in the large strain deformation experiments. 
we have a cubic grain size dependence once we transition into viscous, into the viscous regime. And yeah, this is a fit to our data. Essentially, you know, we, we can see the grain size dependence here. Um, the solid parts is where we actually have data. So we have data, um, especially for the fine grained, we sort of transition into the um, viscous regime, but for the coarser grain samples, we don't. And that's still something we're working on. We have to fix this transition essentially into um, diffusion creep. So very briefly, if we apply this data, if we calculate, forward calculate seismic velocities, so we're making a big step from the microscopic behavior to macroscopic behavior here, uh, the oceanic upper mantle, square root of T cooling, so we can calculate um, geotherms here. And since we measured uh, the behavior, shear modulus and attenuation as a function of temperature, we have to extrapolate to mantle grain sizes, right? So that's another thing to keep in mind. We still have to extrapolate in grain size. But essentially, we can forward calculate for different ages here, seismic velocities, and we'll find that for 100 million years, the green curve is the calculated curve. We can match the um, observations here. That's uh, Garrity um, uh, PA5 model. We can match the observations reasonably well through the low velocity zone. So essentially, we can explain the low velocity zone uh, for old oceanic lithosphere is by temperature and pressure together. So we have to take pressure into account as well and the temperature dependent behavior that we measure. At younger um, ages, we can see that the calculated curve here isn't quite as low as the observations. This is, goes back a while. There are now many more models, of course. Um, but for younger oceanic lithosphere, we need an additional contribution due to, um, and we think that this additional contribution here is melt again. So we have another uh, mechanism, not just temperature, which makes sense. You have to um, invoke something else here near the mid-ocean ridge. So melt, uh, as we saw very briefly, you can get melt squared. Essentially, that redistribution of melt from in between different orientation is an energy loss process that might explain what we see at mid-ocean ridges. And we can see that experimentally, right? So we get a peak. This squishing around of melt leads to a peak. And yeah, the behavior becomes quite complicated when we first saw that. But it turns out, yeah, it's a peak in attenuation that moves around with temperature. And then if you compare the modulus, this is at fine grain sizes, of course. So melt-free, we have a higher modulus. Melt-bearing, we have a reduced modulus. So, so melt affects both <coughs> shear velocities and attenuation. Uh, very briefly, so you saw this diagram already. So now we can start thinking about um, extrapolating our experimental data to longer time scales, in particular also normal modes. And I have to show this diagram again. So this is uh, Ved's work in collaboration, of course. <laughs> I'm glad to show it. You notice that, I'm, that I inverted this here, so time increases to the right. And you know, this, this, this is a little bit, I wanted to point it out. These are questions, right? So here, you, know, you have this frequency dependence, right? Here's an alpha um, of 0.3. I don't know, um, you know, roughly an alpha of 0.3. This would correspond to what we see experimentally. But then at longer periods, you know, the indications are that things are changing. So um, the frequency dependence actually reverses itself. Right? And that doesn't quite fit with what we see experimentally. So there, you know, there's definitely something that we don't quite understand yet. Um, moreover, if you look at even longer periods, tidal dissipation, right? so this is a paper from 2006, they start at 10,000 seconds and then say this is where the absorption band begins. Right? So they have constant Q here. But then at 10,000 seconds, that's where, um, right? So right here, at 10,000 seconds, where this is supposed to go down, the tidal people uh, have the onset of their, you know, absorption band here. So there's clearly something, and experimentally too. So um, if you put that together, right? Experimentally, we also say we have, we don't have an end of this absorption band. We don't go down. We go transition from this, you know mild frequency dependence into the stronger frequency dependence of convection. Right? We know that the Earth convects. Um, and so this transition is something that's on our mind. Very briefly, yeah. We can, of course, apply that to other planets as well. Um, and one of the interesting things is you know, this question that was raised yesterday with Philip, uh, whether you have this partially molten layer near where you have these earthquakes. 
right? So you have earthquakes deep in the lunar mantle, but then right below it, you know, you have partial melt, and that is difficult to reconcile. So again, very much the same if you assume conductive cooling, uh, we can calculate geotherms, we can calculate then velocities, and the velocities match pretty well. Of course, in the upper part, probably there has to be something else going on, like compositional variations. So we're not saying that we explain everything. But in particular, we don't think that there is a partially molten layer here, because um, if we calculate Q with the much the same approach as we did for the Earth, we get you know Q that's lower than observed, all of the observations. Um, as you saw, you know, it's very difficult to do seismology on the moon. Um, but we get a lower Q anyway than is observed just due to temperature. And I would say, you know, we even, you know, have lower temperatures possibly, um, and we'd still satisfy the, the observed Q data. So the other interesting part is, of course, and we just started thinking of that going back to what I just said about extending uh, the time scale here. So that's the, these are the Q observations here. And then uh, there are observations from tidal deformation. And we can actually match you know, with one model, uh, the same model that we calculate seismic velocities and seismic Q, we can calculate the tidal deformation as well for the whole body. And we get pretty good agreement over many decades in frequency. So I think I'll leave it at, at that. So there's still, uh, hopefully the impression was there's still lots of work to be done, still lots of open questions here. OK, thanks. So, Uli, uh, have you explored the trade-off between the selenotherm and how much detail have you looked at the selenotherm and its uh, coupling with your conclusions about the basal structure at the lunar mantle? That is, if you lower the temperature a bit, a few hundred K, which is certainly within the range of limits, you can get a markedly stiffer upper, upper reg uh, mantle of the moon. So how much have you probed uh, the tra thermal and uh, potential deep structure trade-offs there? Uh, so this is mostly work that Francis Nimmo has been done, the uh, tidal modeling. And you can see that a little bit here. I mean, OK, so you know, model input parameters are core heat flux, for example. Um, and you, know, you can ex explore a range of temperatures. And you know, the constraints are that you're trying to fit these tidal observations. And then, um, of course, also you know, staying within the limits of your seismic velocities and Q. So yes, you could, I mean, I, you know, I would have said you can happily move to lower temperatures, especially if you take you know, the Q observations here into account um, and still explain everything. But the key, our key conclusion was that you certainly don't need melt to explain you know, the, 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 tidal ups, the tidal deformation here. You can do that perfectly subsolidus. have a more comp ah thank you if you're looking at a single number and if you have a more complex viscosity structure or a differing viscosity structure you can put a lot of the lunar q into the shallower mantle or shallower region let's put that with the upper thousand kilometers so. not really because if, yeah, if you assume a conductive profile right i mean so there's two things right if you assume a conductive profile we assume the moon is dead right there's no convection anymore well okay uh, there's certainly no recent volcanism no evidence that the surface has been touched in a very long time for the moon so there's no evidence of volcanism. Um, we saw also that you know, the, the seismograms on the moon look very, very, you know, they ring for a long time. If you compare that to the Earth, right, even really very shallow, we get attenuating very quickly. Um, but the other key part in my thinking is certainly the, the deep lunar earthquakes, the deep moonquakes. Right? How can you have a release of brittle energy at a depth of 1,000 kilometers or more and it being at a significant temperature? So on Earth, we think that the deepest earthquakes um, occur you know, in oceanic lithosphere. So aside from subduction, that's a little bit different. But w aside from subduction, the deepest earthquakes in the lithosphere correspond to roughly 600 degrees or so, where you have brittle failure. Right? That's the deepest, that's the highest temperature where you have brittle failure. So you know, if you want to explain, that's, I, that's a question. I, you know, I discussed this with Francis, too. That would push you towards even lower temperatures throughout a considerable part of the lunar mantle. Right? So uh -huh. all these, you know, together, I think, says that the upper part and, you know, the upper part of the moon is, is pretty cold. 
Uh, I, can I, we come back to the earth? Oh. Yes, I had a question. You know, uh, in one of your slides, you have shown uh, uh, the variation of the shear modulus as a function of of a period. Yeah. And I, if I remember well, you know, it's it is decreasing by almost a factor of two. Yeah. Between seismic uh, regime and uh, tide. Uh, uh, okay. Go back. 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 So go back further this way. Yes. Uh, 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 no, yeah, yeah, I think before, before, you know. Oh, right, the, where I show the experimental data. Yes, here. this one here. Yes, yeah. th this one. Okay, so, uh, so, but uh, so, if I understand well, you know, if if this model will uh, be fully correct, uh, this decrease of the shear modulus uh, is something uh, which might be also seen uh, on the data. But uh, if you take the, the love number of the tide, uh, uh, I am not sure that we can uh, get a, such a decrease of the shear modulus to explain the real part of the love number. So the key part here is the grain size, right? Three micron. So you can see that you know the curves here become very steep at three micron. Here we have 23 micron, right? And the curves are much less steep. Yes, but even here, you know, it is it is a, okay. It is a decrease by uh, one third. Sure, but you because know we have to extrapolate that. So we have measurements at up mm. to 150 micron, and the larger the grain size, you know, the the more subtle this decrease yeah. becomes, right? So the the grain size dependence is the key. But did did you try to to see the fit of the real part of the love number? Yeah. Uh, and it is fitting well. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah, with this, so you know, with the grain size, you know, so we have to extrapolate to one centimeter, one millimeter, and one centimeter. So there is the trade-off between grain size and temperature, but the, yeah, we really have to, you know, just like diffusion creep, we can't take the strain rates that we measure at, you know, these kind of grain sizes, and apply it to the mantle. We, you know, would be zooming along, right? It's exactly the same extrapolation for the transient creep as we have to do for, you know, large strain deformation experiments. And if we do that, I mean, this is why I wanted to show the um, um, the seismic part. We can match, you know, if so. There is no other free parameter essentially in here. You know, these the potential temperature. You can argue again whether it's 1300 or you know whatever it is exactly. Other than that, there's no free parameter, but we can reasonably <coughs> fit observed velocities in, in the Earth's upper mantle where we you know have better measurements um, with you know no other fit parameters. So, you know, in that sense, you know, but clearly if you calculate this for, you know, the experimental grain sizes, yeah, you, you know. So there is, yes, clearly there is an extrapolation in grain size, but it's also very clear experimentally you have to, right? There's a grain size dependence in there. Sorry, one last question. Yes, so actually, this, this is the right uh, picture to, <laughs> for my question. You mentioned partial melting for the low velocity zone. The alternative explanation has been water. So yes. can you comment on this? Um, okay, so the comment is nobody has ever measured what water does to transient creep. Right? That's one problem, and that's something we're working on actively, trying to do that. And we have already, we think we have everything in place to be able to do that. And I didn't talk about water at all. Um, the other part is water, then you have to, you have to look in detail on the model, where you want to put your water. Um, and, um, you know, we basically have that dehydration front, presumably everywhere at a fixed depth. It starts to get complicated. Um, I'm not saying that water can't explain anything anywhere. But on the other hand, I think explaining everything with water is also pushing it a little bit too far. In particular, you know, if you go to younger and younger ages, you have melt coming out at a mid-ocean ridge, and you know there are reasonably expectations that you have some retained melt in the upper mantle, so that these low velocities near the ridge or near arcs and back arcs but probably it could, could be assisted by water, right? It could be assisted by water, um, but it, so I, yeah, it could be assisted. One problem that I see, for example, you know, there's also models that say there's a lot of water here at the at the base of the upper mantle. The problem that we have, and here is the anharmonic, the anharmonic curve I didn't explain, that's basically elastic behavior, right? So you can see that the seismic models tend to cross over even the, the uh, elastic behavior. So the velocities here at the base of the upper mantle are really fast. And, and Fabio Camerano, you know, and a number of other people have commented on this that, 
it's very difficult to explain these high velocities here. That was, you know, we had a grain size increase here. You have to, these velocities are really fast. So if you then say that there's also a lot of water here near the transition zone, uh, you know, so there are problems. Um, you know, if, if, if water is everywhere, um, you know, that you then have contradictions between, so there are lots of mechanisms that make velocities slower, like water, melt, dislocations, many others that I haven't discussed. Um, but you have observations where they're fast velocities, and then you'd have to say, well, there can't be any water. We know that, you know, what the temperature, well, we have some ideas what the temperature is, so we can't be in a purely anharmonic regime. So <laughs> that's a sort of long-winded answer, and the bottom line is we haven't really looked at water in detail, you know, what that does in comparison to other mechanisms. <laughs> 